Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about aircraft size, or more accurately, the lack thereof. While the old slogan of bigger is better works for some things, in the world of fighter aircraft, bigger is often a significant detriment. Something that I've talked about several times here on this channel was the search for escort fighters in the Second World War. The bigger, heavier fighters often suffered because of their size. While stronger, they were less agile and vulnerable to smaller aircraft. Additionally, no matter what time period you look at, there are effective limits to how big you can make a plane. I mean, you can technically make something enormous, but it may not be viable. Still, despite the problems related to maneuverability, speed, engine power, durability, etc., this didn't stop people from making or attempting to make massive, sometimes outlandish aircraft. Conversely, while there was interest in making massive aircraft, there was also an interest in making teeny tiny aircraft. In World War II, one of the best fighters across all theaters and countries was actually one of these little aircraft, a microfighter, as I will call it, and that was the Yak-3 from the Soviet Union. Looking at a lot of Soviet aircraft, they seem to be lighter than the planes flown by America or Germany. While I'm not sure if there was an explicit reason for this, it seems to me that this was because a lot of Soviet engines were comparatively underpowered, so the planes needed to be smaller and lighter on average to match the performance of German fighters. Despite its small stature, the Yak-3 was an incredible and pretty beloved aircraft, weighing just 4,600 pounds empty with a top speed over 400 miles an hour at altitude and loved by pilots for its control and maneuverability. For the Yak-3 and Soviet fighters in general, it seemed as though smaller was better. The impressive performance of the Yak-3 in mind, we head on over to the United States in the years preceding the Second World War, with the U.S. military being interested by the superior performance of racing aircraft. Now, of course, racing aircraft proper wouldn't exactly be good military aircraft on account of the fact that they don't have weapons or armor, but regardless, the U.S. military was interested in the more minimalist, power-focused designs of racing aircraft and wanted to bring that over into the military realm. To this idea, the company Douglas stepped up to the plate in 1939 with one of the smallest fighter designs of the World War II era, a rail-thin, lightweight, high-speed fighter design intended to serve as a point defender. This is the Douglas XP-48. First, before we get to the design proper, we need to talk about where a plane's weight comes from. Probably the biggest single source of weight, or weight from a single item, comes from the engine. Let's use two fighters as examples, the F-4U Corsair and the FW-190, two planes I picked off the top of my head. The Corsair, with an empty weight of around 9,200 pounds, has an engine that comprises roughly a quarter of that, with the R2800 making up around 2,360 pounds dry. For the 190, with an empty weight of just over 7,000 pounds, its BMW 801 engine comprises nearly a third of that weight at around 2,200 pounds. On a good deal of fighter aircraft from the time, it's a relatively safe assumption that the engine made up at least 20% or so of the weight. Then, for another significant source of weight, we have the fluids that make the plane go, like oil and fuel and coolant and whatnot. Using our two example planes, the Corsair's internal 234-gallon fuel tank would add 1,450 pounds when full. On the 190, it would add just over a thousand pounds with its 169 gallon fuel tank. Then, of course, you have the cockpit electronics and whatnot, the guns and bombs, and how could I forget the frame and skin of the plane? It's kind of hard to have a plane without the frame or the skin over that frame. 
However, I explicitly mention the engine weight and fuel weight, as on the XP-48, that seemed to be a major way that they wanted to save weight, along with just making the plane really, really small, measuring in at just 6.63 meters long, 9.8 meters wide, and 2.7 meters tall, the proposed frame was remarkably thin, with both a narrow fuselage and long, narrow wings. No specific reason was given for these narrow wings, but I would assume that it was done to reduce wingtip drag and thus increase speed. These wings would also likely have a negative effect of reducing maneuverability, but reaching higher speeds like racing aircraft was the top priority here. No building material is listed for the frame or skin, but one would assume that it would be made of quite thin wood or aluminum. Any extra armor, any extra thickness in the frame or skin was added weight and that would most likely be avoided. This likely meant that the XP-48 would almost entirely rely on speed and maneuverability to survive, much like the Japanese Zero. But again, with the long wings, that maneuverability would probably be a bit more difficult. Regardless though, powering this tiny frame was a tiny engine, a Ranger V770 supercharged with just 525 horsepower to its name. But with a weight of around 700 or so pounds, it did help keep the weight down. Generally, weight increases with horsepower on these kind of engines, so the XP-48 had to have this tiny engine for both weight and aerodynamic purposes. Then, for the other focal point I mentioned, the fuel capacity, the XP-48 would have a horribly small fuel tank that held just 50 gallons of fuel putting it about on par with the 2022 Ford F-450 truck. This video is not sponsored by Ford. This tiny fuel tank would add just 300 pounds when full, significantly less than basically every other fighter in World War II. While saving a great deal in weight, this would also significantly reduce the range of the plane. So unless drop tanks were to be outfitted, the XP-48 would be incredibly limited in what it could do. Following along with the weight reduction focus, the armament would be very light for a U.S. fighter in 1939, really more on par with something made a decade prior when biplanes were more common. The 48 would be armed with just two guns, one a 30 caliber machine gun and one a 50 caliber machine gun each firing in unison through the propeller. The 30 caliber would have 500 rounds, and the 50 cal would have around 200. With the empty weight of the XP-48 sitting at just 2,675 pounds, and the gross weight sitting at 3,400 pounds, the bulk of the weight added between the two came from the ammo probably around 400 or so pounds, accounting for some added weight for engine oil and coolants and whatnot. Another thing to mention about the design, because the wings were so thin, the landing gear had to be altered as well. Instead of being on the wings and folding upward into them, the wings had to fold outward from the fuselage. They would fold out with two hinges or pivot points. So one would assume that this would end up creating some issues down the line in having both of these pivot points stay sturdy. Considering all factors, the weight, engine power, reduced drag wing tips, Douglas put forward an eye-popping estimation of the XP-48's performance. They estimated that it would be able to comfortably reach 350 miles an hour and even reach speeds, and this is not a joke, upwards of 525 miles an hour, a top speed that early jet fighters just about matched. Now, they were also heavier, granted, but Douglas was estimating that for one horsepower of the engine, that would equal one mile an hour in top speed, something that no other plane in World War II came even close to matching. Even the Yak-3, with a 1,200 horsepower engine, could only hit just above 400. 
525 miles an hour in 1939 would be incredible, a technological miracle. Now, I know this may be shocking, but the U.S. military didn't exactly believe Douglas when they gave this top speed projection. They would give Douglas some attention and interest, thus why the plane had the designation of XP-48, but they also decided to investigate the design and that top speed estimation. While the U.S. military would not provide a counter to this number, they would state quite bluntly, performance with proposed engine installation not considered feasible, contract cancelled, thus bringing an abrupt end to the XP-48 project. Now, even though the U.S. military didn't provide their speed estimation, I do think we can place a rough estimate. There was a comparable plane that actually flew, using the same engine with just a slightly higher weight. That was the XP-77, an all-wood fighter prototype dimensionally smaller, but again slightly heavier. When that plane flew, it hit speeds upwards of 330 miles an hour, factoring in a slight reduction in weight and a slight reduction in drag with the thin wings, I do think it's plausible that it could hit around 350, maybe 360 miles an hour. So perhaps Douglas got the 350 mile an hour part kind of right, but the 525 mile an hour top speed would be the work of a wizard. And if they've got magic, then why use planes? Just summon lightning and be done with it. But still, even though Douglas was grossly overestimating how good the XP-48 would have been, I do think in another country the XP-48 would have been a pretty interesting design. Somewhere like the Soviet Union, where they used a lot of light fighters and needed to just pump out aircraft, and they were on the defensive to start, so the short range wouldn't be much of an issue. Or perhaps over in Japan as a kamikaze. The short range wouldn't really matter because the plane wouldn't be coming back anyway. But over in America, whether it be on carriers over in the Pacific, or in North Africa or Normandy, the XP-48 just didn't make any logistical sense. They really wouldn't have any use for it, and to make it useful, the fuel capacity would have to be increased substantially, which would hurt the top speed. Put simply, it was the wrong plane for the wrong country. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, at some point, Douglas should have just promised that the plane could hit Mach 1. I mean, just go for broke. You're already lying, so why not have fun with it? Say it can hit Mach 1 with a range of 10,000 miles. Why not? You're advertising the plane, not answering questions under oath. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.